everybody. Um, are we getting excited? We can feel we can feel the anticipation of what the Lord is doing and how close we're getting to being able to meet. Oh, we have to see what's going on. But in the process, uh, the scripture that I have for you today is 145, 3 through 7. Great is the Lord and highly to be praised, and His greatness is so vast and so deep as to be unsearchable. One generation shall allow your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wonderful works I will meditate. Men shall speak of the might of your tremendous and terrible acts, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth like a fountain the fame of your great and abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness and justice. Thank you, Jesus. We, we will never tire of, of proclaiming your goodness. Hey. Hey, you, watching this video right now, I've got a secret for you. We're reopening! Woo! Yeah! Woo! Woo! Yeah! It's the moment you've all been waiting for. It is official, but we have some restrictions. Wah, 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 wah. That's right. I know that not everybody agrees with how things have been handled. I know that everybody has a different opinion about this issue. Um, there's a lot of you, man, I'm too fat for this stuff, <laughs> but I'm so excited. I know a lot of you say that you've got a piece of paper that was signed and dated 1776 saying you've got the right pretty much do whatever you want, right? <laughs> and you're not wrong in that. Um, however, we also have other people who are older, who have compromised immune systems, and unfortunately fall in that category that even something as simple as the flu is a life-threatening hazard for them. And so, in the body of Christ, we have the right to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. And so uh, the Apostle Paul teaches us here because I totally agree about that piece of paper signed 1776 But I always go back to the most important piece of paper that gives me true freedom No matter what my government has to say about things and that's the Word of God and in 1st Corinthians chapter 10 verse 23 And this has been sort of our stand on verse through this whole season that the Lord has guided us through Paul teaches I have the right to do anything that's what you say, but not everything's beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything's constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. And so in this season, you know, we choose to humble ourselves, to put some of our rights aside for the benefit of others. We're doing what Jesus did to love and to care for the least of these. And so that's why we have chosen to discontinue services uh, in person for a season. Also, as a result, financially, um, outreach wise, our church has grown exponentially. We've seen amazing things happen through this season. The church was never discontinued. And so I want to challenge you. If you found that personally in your own life through this season um, that you haven't really grown much spiritually and you didn't really do much to serve people, man, get in your word, get in the spirit because you're missing something awesome. You're missing a movement. You're missing a momentum uh, here in this season. Um, but today's a new day. It's your day to jump on board and to be a part of it. Okay, so with that in mind, um, our leadership, um, has come to get come up with a few guidelines for the good of everyone for the mutual benefit of everybody so when we meet in person here are the reopening guidelines first of all we're going to maintain six feet of social distancing between families so for example myself Becky Nate um, Megan and Bethany we're family, we live together, we're already exposed to each other. If one of us had something that is contagious, we're already exposed to it. So you can be together, 
but between your family unit and others, maintain six feet at all times. So that means, unfortunately, it's super hard for me to, but we're asking if there's no handshaking, no hugging, uh, no high-fiving, no physical contact between social, uh, between family units. Uh, also, if you're uncomfortable with attending, there is no shame. There is, uh, you know, n no reason to feel bad or guilty about that. We want you to attend the in-person services when you are comfortable doing so, when you feel safe to do so. And uh, so all you, uh, you know, 1776ers out there that uh, just stand on your rights and say, well, everyone else is just moving in fear and this whole thing's a whole hoax. Please keep that between you and the Lord. He's going to judge you for that, not me. But please, please don't shame your brothers and sisters in Christ because I don't believe they're moving in fear. I believe they're moving in wisdom and what's best for them. So please, if you're not comfortable coming, that's fine. We have online services. You can attend that way. Uh, we don't want you to feel any kind of pressure uh, to attend before you're comfortable with that. So if you're uncomfortable attending, if you're running a fever, or if you're just not feeling well, uh, we ask you to stay home uh, and just to enjoy our online service. Uh, so those are the, the first two reopening guidelines. The third one, uh, face coverings, they're recommended, but we're not requiring them. So, you know, use your best judgment on that matter. And also, in light of everything, uh, we're going to unfortunately, for a temporary season, uh, discontinue the fellowship and, uh, you know, breakfast that's available at 930. Uh, actually, we won't be providing any type of self-serve uh, drinks. Even the water fountains will be closed, uh, you know, just to uh, keep everyone safe. Uh, you know, as safe as possible. Uh, so if you'd like to bring your own drink, your own coffee, you know, a, a bottle of water, feel free to do that. Um, but we will not have those available. And so uh, we're going to be having a second video of what it's going to look like when you come into the church, because there will be some changes uh, to, uh, to follow these guidelines. And we want everyone to know exactly what's expected of you. Uh, because we don't want anyone to ruin this for us. You know, I don't want to uh, start off our services and you've got that one guy that just got to run up and hug everybody. And people are like, you know, trying to get away from him. But he's just like, man, I love you. Right? <laughs> we don't want anybody to ruin this for the rest of us. So we're going to show you what it's going to look like when you come into the church. Um, but above all, you know, yes, these are some loose guidelines we want you to follow uh, to ensure the safety of everybody for their benefit, not for ours. We're going to sacrifice our rights, you know, for their benefit. But above all, I want you to come when you're ready, hungry, and expecting a powerful move of the Holy Spirit. We want you to come excited and uh, just expecting to have an encounter with God because we know that the Lord will meet you there. So we are so excited to be reopening our services and drum roll please, think June 7th at 10.30 a.m. And we do encourage you if you want to come 10, 15 minutes early to try to sneak in before the late crowd uh, to you know keep distancing, that's great. But we are reopening June 7th at 10.30 a.m. God bless. I can't wait to see you again. And we're just excited for what God has been doing through this challenging season and the even greater things that are yet to come. Good morning, and welcome to New Hope Assembly of God's online service. Um, I'm sure you've caught the news already. Uh, if we haven't reached out to you, we will be soon. Uh, but we have decided to reopen our in-person services, and that's happening next week, June 7th at 10.30 a.m. Uh, this week, we celebrate an incredible event. It's Pentecost Sunday! As you can see, I'm wearing my, my red here, you know, representing the fire of God, uh, indicative of the Holy Spirit. Um, Pentecost, literally translated, it's not all that exciting. Pentecost just means 50th. 
Um, Pentecost um, was also known as the Festival of Weeks or to the, the Jews who still celebrate it, Shavuot. Um, you know, so it has several different names, Pentecost, Festival of Weeks or Feast of Weeks or Shavuot. Um, it was one of the three feasts that Jewish men uh, were commanded to observe. They had to go back to Jerusalem um, and present uh, various offerings to the Lord. It was a joyous celebration though. It was a, a time representing the harvest of the wheat. Um, and it was for this very reason to celebrate this festival that people from every nation on the world were gathered together in Jerusalem in that place, as we read about in Acts chapter 2. Uh, they were celebrating the Festival of Weeks, uh, celebrating Pentecost on that day. Now we know that God is a God of miracles, and we're continuing that series. Now in my opinion, and uh, I feel pretty strongly about this, but it's my opinion, uh, two of the greatest miracles that one could ever receive is first of all, salvation being forgiven of all of your sins, being made a new creation, all those things, your salvation, greatest miracle ever. Second greatest miracle, in my opinion, is that of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When God chooses to fill us with his presence, I mean, the very presence of God dwelling within us, it is a miracle that just far exceeds even my ability to explain, you know, verbally, but it is an amazing thing. And I don't wanna see anyone miss out on this awesome opportunity to receive it. Um, you know, today we celebrate Pentecost a little differently than the early church did on that day that we find in Acts 2, um, you know, a little differently because we were remembering sort of the, the birth of the church, the beginning of the church, when the Spirit was poured out on all people. Um, and it's just an exciting event to look at. You see, this feast, this Festival of Weeks, Feast of Weeks, it was prophetically defined by God centuries before this event ever took place in Acts chapter 2. And we find it here in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 9 to 11. And God had instructed his people. He said, count off seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the standing grain. So you count off seven weeks and you get how many days? Seven times seven? 49. Then following that, you have what day? The 50th day, Pentecost. <laughs> and verse 10 says, then celebrate the festival of weeks to the Lord your God by giving a free will offering in proportion to the blessings that the Lord your God has given you. And rejoice before the Lord your God at the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name, capital N, his person. You, your sons, your daughters, your male and female servants, the Levites in your towns, the foreigners, the fatherless, and the widows living among you. This was a festival for everyone. It was a time of rejoicing. It was a time of celebrating. It was a time when everybody got to enter into the presence of God and just rejoice and celebrate him and to uh, bring in free will offerings in the proportion uh, to the, the blessings that God had poured out during that season. And so we find then that is, uh, you know, Old Testament, uh, what this was foreshadowing and looking forward to, why they would celebrate the Feast of Weeks, was the place that God would choose to dwell, for his name to dwell. And then in Acts chapter 1, the resurrected Jesus instructed his followers to wait in Jerusalem for the gift that the Father had promised, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter 2, after praying and seeking and waiting, God's people received that promise. God chose a dwelling place for his name, and it was no longer a physical city on the earth, Jerusalem. Rather, it was within the lives of his people through the Holy Spirit. Men, women, children, sons, daughters, old, young, servants, foreigners, fatherless, widows, widowers, all people given the opportunity to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now check out this analogy that is very appropriate for our uh, region. I, I love that, you know, the Assemblies of God put this video together and uh, how we just get it because we so live this. You know, some of you in your everyday lives, in your workplaces, you're just living it. You know, and I pray that this video will, will remind you when you're there at work about the Holy Spirit there with you and for you, filling you to overflowing. Uh, so we're going to learn a little bit about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So enjoy this clip. This is Cole. For nearly 50 years, coal has been used in our country to generate the lion's share of electricity for our homes, businesses, and industry. This electricity has provided us with power for lighting, heating, 
cooling, cooking, washing, communicating, entertaining, well, you get the idea. Simply stated, electricity is essential in providing for the many needs and amenities we enjoy in America. Here at this power plant, every few days a string of coal cars arrives packed with coal from out of state. When the coal arrives, it drops through the bottom of each car into this unloading station. From here it travels by conveyor belt, where it is piled and sized for processing. The coal is then moved to a mill station, where it is ground into a fine powder and used as fuel to fire a huge furnace chamber, heating it to over a thousand degrees. Here in the chamber, water courses through a grid of boiler piping and is superheated to create an intense steam. The steam is then piped into a large turbine engine where the pressure from the steam rotates the mechanical turbine, turning the electrical generator. As the generator spins, molecules move and charge, creating electricity. That electricity is then transferred to the switchyard just outside the plant where it's distributed to a number of substations throughout the region, and then on to homes and businesses, supplying them with power. When you think about it, the process for generating electrical power has many similarities to the process we must all follow as Christians for having spiritual power. When we receive Christ at the moment of salvation, we become a new creation. The Holy Spirit indwells our being and resides in us. And at that moment, we're given a great resource. But like any resource, if it's going to be helpful, it's got to be processed and put to use. Take this lump of coal. It's of little value if I just stand here and hold it. But if you process it and put it to use, it can be a great tool as we've seen. It's the same for us as believers. If we have the Holy Spirit inside us and we never tap into His power, we miss a great opportunity to do more and reach the full potential God offers us beyond our own gifts and talents. Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. These final words of our Savior describe a powerful experience that we as Pentecostals hold dear. It's described in many ways in the Bible, but Jesus and others called it the baptism in the Holy Spirit. He also called it the promise of the Father. One of the things we need to realize is that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for every Christian. In the book of Acts, on the day of Pentecost, the Bible says that they were all filled with the Spirit. Peter told the crowd on that day that that promise was for you, for your children, and for all who are far off, even as many as the Lord himself shall call. Friend, Peter was talking about us, all of us who are in Christ Jesus. Baptism in the Holy Spirit is a separate experience that follows salvation. It is not a requirement for salvation, but it is a benefit that every member of the body of Christ can enjoy. So the Holy Spirit baptism is not a requirement of salvation for the non-Christian, but it is an empowering experience for the Christian so that they can be supernaturally equipped. The book of Acts demonstrates a very clear-cut pattern. The Holy Spirit baptism occurs only after someone has truly accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Now the Holy Spirit is present during this process, for He is the convicting agent that draws someone to Jesus and baptizes him into Christ. But there is another experience that is different than and subsequent to salvation, and that's where the power of the Holy Spirit is so very real. With that experience comes intimacy, where we want to live a righteous, holy life. And also, there comes a power to witness. One of the things I've learned in being here at this plant, that creating power is really a noisy business. The fire stokes, the pressure bills, the turbine whines, 
the generator rumbles. Believe me, it's noisy, but it's all part of the process. Isn't that just like the Spirit? The historical record of the book of Acts shows that the baptism is always accompanied by speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. On the day of Pentecost, they were all filled with the Spirit and spoke in other tongues or languages as the Spirit enabled them. This recurring sign of Acts is the initial physical evidence of the Holy Spirit and a sign that one has been baptized in the Holy Spirit. To me personally, I view the baptism much like this furnace chamber here at the plant, or for that matter, like a steam kettle on a stove. When the water gets hot and begins to boil, there's no containing it. It's going to be released, and with it will come a sound. So it is with our spirit. When we approach God in brokenness, with a heart full of love for God, and our mouths filled with thankfulness for His wonderful gift of salvation, there come a point when we're full and our spirit cannot be contained. Now, out of this baptism process, we're empowered beyond our own capabilities. We're virtually immersed in the Spirit of God in His presence. Human timidness is gone, and we're filled with confidence to share the gospel. There's this desire to live a holy life, to be more Christ-like, to live beyond our capabilities. There's a desire to read the Word, there's a desire to be a greater disciple. And there's this desire to help others. The day we accepted Christ, we were given a great opportunity, the power of His Spirit, unleashed through baptism in our lives, with power to live, to serve, and to win others for all eternity. Friends, let's not squander it. I don't know about you, but my prayer is, Lord, send the wind. And so our lives were designed to be filled with and empowered by the Holy Spirit, the very presence of God dwelling within our lives. We're like containers, like cups that hold that fluid presence of God. Sure. I mean, take for example, you know, I mean, our, our lives were designed for it, designed to possess it, but not all of our lives, um, you know, contain it. So we're going to take, for example, um, this screw. I would like to get this screw into this two by four, this chunk of wood, you know, and uh, I can do it on my own, but I've been given a gift. I've been given a tool. I've been given this by my lovely wife many, many years ago. The battery doesn't hold much of a charge anymore, but it's still a blessing to have. Um, now this tool on its own is able to drive this screw into this wood. You know, I can place the bit here and kind of turn the chuck and surely enough, that screw has gone into the wood. And given more time, you know, probably another minute, I could turn that chuck and uh, put the screw into the wood and move on to the next screw to complete the project, right? I am able to do that. However, this tool was designed for a much greater purpose. It was designed to operate far more efficiently, um, you know, than how I'm using it right now. But what we need for that to take place is the power source, right? But when I connect this thing to a power source, all of a sudden, I'm able to place the bit into the screw, and in no time, place that screw right in the wood, right? And I can back it out, you know, and do this over and over again. It gets the same job done, but when it's connected to a power source, it is able to get the job done far more effectively and with far more joy, you know, than I would have been able to accomplish a task beforehand. It feels like a lot less work when we're connected to a power source and when we're using that tool to its full potential. That analogy is sort of like your life. There are so many things that you can do that you were designed to do, you are created to do, you have the talents to do, and you can do them pretty well on your own. 
But when we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when we are equipped and empowered by God, we are able to reach our full potential. And, and, and ministry no longer becomes a chore, but it becomes a joy to serve and to fulfill our purpose in life. And so we don't want anyone to miss out on the bigger impact that our lives could be making when we lack the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, and so, you know, God has given us these things. We can all worship God. We can all grow in our faith and knowledge and understanding of him. We can all tell people about Jesus. We can all uh, serve other people compassionately, you know, to a degree. However, we also have the opportunity to do those things on a much larger scale with much more joy, much more, uh, you know, much more fulfillment because we're doing it less on our own and more through God's equipping, through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You see, when we give our lives to Jesus, but when we, when we accept his salvation and we just walk in faith and uh, believe in him, we're given an initial deposit of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that, the Holy Spirit does many things. You know, we're made a new creation. He starts changing us from the inside out. We're sealed and marked for the day of redemption. I mean, there's all these different things that the Holy Spirit does. Um, however, um, think about your checking account. You know, you can open that checking account and establish that relationship with the bank and you receive, you know, you have that initial deposit, you know, usually it's like $25. But we all know that our bank accounts have the uh, potential to possess far, far more than that initial deposit, right? So it is with our lives. You know, when we're saved, we all receive the Holy Spirit, but our lives are designed to contain so much more than just an initial deposit. Our lives are designed to not only be filled with the Spirit, but overflowing with the Spirit. You are capable of so much more, so don't miss out on it. Um, as with all things, we go to the Word of God, because for sure, this is one of the distinct doctrines of the Assemblies of God. It's not something that every church agrees with. It's not, you know, something that even every Pentecostal agrees with necessarily. But um, I know I'll, I'll share my testimony here at the end of the video. But with all things, we go to the Word of God. The word of God is true. Me, I don't know everything in full yet. So I go to the word to learn and to understand things. And the word has a lot to say about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In fact, I'm not even gonna cover it all today, but we're gonna cover the basics of this. Now, uh, the Greek word for baptize uh, is the word baptizo. And it literally means to submerge or to immerse. That's why when we do water baptism, we do it by immersion, by submersion. You're going to get wet. You're going to get saturated and soaked because that's what that word means. It, you know, um, it's, it, the word baptize means to immerse. So that's what we do, uh, you know, at New Hope. Um, now, the cool thing is that all four gospel accounts record this event. And anytime that's the case, that is significant. That is something so important that the, the early church wanted to make sure it was recorded and passed down for generation to generation. They didn't want us to miss out on this significant historical event that took place. Now, this event that's recorded in all four gospel accounts was John the Baptist, who was preparing the way for Jesus. And he was baptizing people in water. Um, and when they, you know, John taught the same as we teach. When we put our faith in Jesus, when we choose to repent of our sins, we get immersed in water just as an outward sign of that inward change that took place. I'm a new creation. The old's gone and I rise up in the new life. That's what John taught water baptism is. You know, the, John baptized as a sign of the repentance of sins, that people had turned away from their sins and into their new life. But John also taught, as he baptized people, that one was coming, and his name, of course, is Jesus. We know him full well. And when he came, he would baptize us in the Holy Spirit. All four accounts record this truth um, because it's incredibly significant. Not only is this the first time that we read in the scriptures about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, um, but it's also when the Holy Spirit filled Jesus after being water baptized by John, John saw the Holy Spirit descending on Jesus like a dove. We also, this is another reason it's such a historic event and such a significant event. In this instant, you see undeniable evidence of how God exists as a triune Godhead, the Trinity, three in one. We see simultaneously 
uh, Jesus, the Son in the flesh. We see the Holy Spirit descending in bodily form like a dove. And we hear the voice of the Father from heaven saying, this is my Son whom I am well pleased. And so you see the evidence of those three distinct persons in one, God. All four gospel accounts also indicate that it was that time that Jesus began his earthly ministry. And that's incredibly significant, that Jesus, God in the flesh, did not begin his earthly ministry until he was filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, that's significant. If, if he waited for that moment, then how much more should we seek after the baptism of the Holy Spirit, um, you know, in order to be more effective and more, um, you know, uh, empowered and more joyful in ministry? We need the presence of God to fill our lives. Ministry is to be the outflowing of the Holy Spirit and not really about us. And so it records that, um, that event when the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus. And now we turn to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 to 18. And Paul warns us, he says, to be very careful how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. And for sure, the days are growing more and more evil as the time that Jesus returns and draws near. So in verse 17, he says, therefore, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Don't live unwise. Make the most of every opportunity. Understand what God's will is. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, think about this. You don't, you know, wake up in the morning, plug your cell phone in, leave it plugged in for about five minutes, and then go about the rest of your day expecting to use that phone the whole day, right? <laughs> It would likely die shortly after that. Um, we, we don't lay down at night, you know, and set our alarm for 30 minutes and then wake up all like ready to start the day, expecting to be fully energetic and ready to take on whatever challenges face you the rest of the day, right? No, you'd be exhausted. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I say this out of love and compassion. Why in the world do we choose to treat our spiritual life in those ways? I mean, think about it. Even, even when we think we are being self-disciplined, you know, spending five minutes praying and reading a devotional every day, why in the world do we think that that is sufficient to live a spirit-filled life when we can hear his voice and follow his lead and see his miraculous hand in our everyday life? We have to do our part. God is faithful. He has promised and he will fulfill his part. But we have a part to play when it comes to being baptized and, and remaining filled with the Holy Spirit. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is a choice. In the same way that keeping our cell phones charged is a choice. Keeping our bodies rested is a choice. We have to do our part as God does his part. He has promised to pour out the Holy Spirit. But we have to stay connected to him so that he might pour it out right? Um, even wireless chargers, you have to be close. You have to be connected to that charger for that battery to be filled. In the same way, brothers and sisters, we have to stay connected with the Holy Spirit, connected with God in order for his presence to fill us. We just have to, um, you know, it's much like maybe keeping our phones on the charger throughout the day. It keeps our um, cell phones charged up, right? It keeps our batteries full. Got to stay connected, to stay filled up with the Holy Spirit. And as we walk with the Spirit, we stay filled with the Spirit. Now, we already learned from Acts 1 where Jesus promised, um, you know, uh, his, the disciples that they would receive the promise of God, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And we already learned from Acts 2 where they received it. So I'm not going to go over that again today. Now, the infilling of the Holy Spirit we see that this continued to be a um, pattern, that it would follow the salvation of people. The people would get saved, they would put their faith in Jesus, they would follow him, you know, oftentimes they'd be water baptized in the name of Jesus, but the infilling of the Holy Spirit came subsequent to that. Not every single instance, there's a few instances uh, where it came simultaneously, but more often than not, it came subsequent to salvation. 
Um, I'm going to read a few examples of that here throughout the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 14, it says, When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. So you see, they're believers. They, they heard that they received the word of God and they believed it. And when they arrived, they prayed for the new believers. They were believers. They believed in Jesus. They were saved. And it says that they, they prayed that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They'd simply been baptized in the name of Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So here you see a clear distinction where people were saved, they were baptized in the name of Jesus, but they hadn't received the Holy Spirit yet. Uh, at least they hadn't been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so uh, when Peter and John lay their hands on them, they received it. And, and that is um, not always the case, but sometimes people receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit through the laying on of hands, uh, and they receive it. A similar event took place in Corinth. Um, in Acts chapter 19, verses 1 to 7, we read this. It says, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the exterior and arrived at Ephesus. So my apologies, this happened in Ephesus. <laughs> it says, there he found some disciples and he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, no, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And so Paul asked, well, what baptism did you receive then? You see, he's referring about baptism when we talk about receiving the Holy Spirit. And they replied, John's baptism. And Paul taught. He said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one who was coming after him, that is, in Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men there in all. You see, sometimes we haven't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit simply because we've never really heard about it. It's not something the church teaches about on a regular basis, unfortunately. Um, however, when you look at the early church, it is a, a, a prime focus of their teaching. You know, their teaching is all about people re putting their faith in Jesus, repenting of their sins, being saved, and being filled with the Spirit. I mean, those are the two, you know, essential keys, key aspects that the early church was passionate about, that all the world would receive those things, salvation and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, and maybe sometimes we haven't received it because we're a little weary of it. It's a little weird to speak in tongues. It's not something that normally happens every day. Um, sometimes we've been taught that it just, it's a lie, that it's uh, from the enemy, that it's demonic, that it's not from God, that, you know, that it's something that ceased, that it's not something that happens today. We have all these miscommunications and misteachings out there. But when we go to the Word of God, it very clearly teaches the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a gift of the Father available to all believers. So don't miss out on it, my friends, just because you may have heard a teaching against it, just because you may have heard someone have a bad experience, somebody misused that gift, go back to the Word. What does the Word teach? So far, we've seen two instances where um, people believed, they put their faith in Jesus, they were new believers. Uh, in one case, they had even been water baptized in the name of Jesus. In the other case, they were baptized in the name of Jesus, but then both times, they also, subsequent to that, received the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Now, I love it because, as I mentioned before, God very rarely works the same miracle twice. And it's no different than the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's no, um, there's no formula to receiving it. In fact, look at what happened here in Acts chapter 10. Long story short, Peter, kicking and screaming through visions and visitations, went to the house of a Gentile to tell them about salvation. It's the house of Cornelius and his family. And so he goes there, he starts sharing the good news about Jesus, and they believe it. And it says in Acts chapter 10, verse 34, that while Peter was still speaking these words, he was still teaching them about salvation, while he was still speaking, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter, they were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. And then Peter said, well, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They receive the Holy Spirit the same as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. 
You know, and we see this other trend, you know, over and over again. And again, this is a, a doctrine that's distinct to the assemblies of God. Um, you know, it's, it's one that we teach. It's one that we believe because it's one that we see. I mean, it's there in the word. Um, you know, that these, these um, they call them circumcised believers. They're Jews. Um, over and over again, they knew that someone had been baptized in the Holy Spirit, that they had been received the Holy Spirit because of the initial physical evidence of speaking in tongues. You know, that's how they knew. Um, they knew for certainty that they had been filled with the Spirit because they began speaking in other tongues. And often uh, something would accompany that. They'd prophesy, they'd praise God, they'd worship, you know. Um, but uh, we, we usually see that happening, that being the case. Um, in fact, Peter, he shares this testimony. He goes back to Jerusalem and he shares with the, the Jewish believers what is happening. And in Acts chapter 11, verse 15, he described it this way. He said, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them just as he had come on us in the beginning back in Acts 2. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. Don't you love it when God brings his word back to remembrance? John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift that he had given us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? <laughs> when they heard this, they had no further objections and praise God saying, so then even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. And so it was the baptism of the Holy Spirit that was the indicator that God had saved even a Gentile like you and I likely are, that he had saved them because of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that, that physical evidence of God's um, outpouring into their lives. So how do we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Well, it's pretty simple and basic, really. Um, ask for it and believe without a doubt that we'll receive it. And you will. Jesus actually said this in Luke chapter 11, verse 11 to 13. He said, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will you give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will you give him a scorpion? If you, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You know, and just to share sort of my personal testimony, you know, I, I came from a church that, that uh, the pastor taught, and I firmly believed it and had the scriptures to defend it, uh, that there was really no such thing as a second work of grace, of a second work of God, that once you've received his salvation— I mean, the abundance of his salvation was more than enough. You didn't need anything else. His salvation and the fullness of it is all that we needed to seek after. However, you know, another pastor challenged me. And so I went back to the word, you know, because I wasn't raised in a church. I don't have a church background. I wasn't indoctrinated by teachings of men. You know, when I was a teenager and gave my life to Jesus, I had the Bible and that was my church. You know, I mean, of course, I had the awesome people at New Hope, you know, on several occasions uh, to pour into my life. But, um, you know, but I went to the Word, and so that's what I've trained myself to do. Whenever I hear a teaching or whenever I'm challenged on something, and I'm not sure if it's true, and I go back to the Word. And as I went through and studied the Word, the three examples I gave today, and there's so many others, and I started seeing this, this trend. I started seeing that the, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, um, you know, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it was something that took place um, sometimes with salvation, but often subsequent to it. And so, you know, when I saw this in the Word, I was convicted. You know, I felt so awful for teaching so strongly against this to the body of Christ, teaching that it was not of God, um, you know. And so uh, in that church that didn't, you know, believe in it, uh, I, I went in that empty church, you know, as a youth pastor there. So I got there early and I just fell on my knees at the altar, just me and God. And I just repented for my boneheadedness, for, you know, not really going to the Word and letting God's Word be my truth. Um, you know, and, and I told God, I'm, I literally I just said, God, I don't want to miss out on anything you have for me. God, if the baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, I see it in your word. If it's something that you have promised that I can receive, I want to receive it right now. And as I was praying, I just started praying in tongues. I was just like, And I was just so overwhelmed by the presence of God. And I'm telling you, my ministry was transformed from that day forward. I was teaching and preaching the word of God. I was an elder. I was, you know, uh, doing all of these things in the church. But my ministry was so much more effective and so much more joyful 
after receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Things that I had struggled with in my flesh. You know, I'd shared my struggles with pornography and stuff before. You know, things that I just couldn't break free from on my own. They always had a hold on me. I didn't even think about them anymore. I mean, I was just so overwhelmed by the presence of God that nothing else mattered. It's like everything else became far secondary. And uh, I don't want anyone to miss out on that opportunity. You know, no one had to lay hands on me. You know, there's nothing wrong with that necessarily. Uh, you know, no one had to be there with me, praying in tongues over me, you know, for me to receive it. It's just between you and God. You ask God to receive the gift that he had promised and he'll give it to you. That's how it works. And I want to encourage you, if you ask and you don't receive it at first, don't get discouraged. Don't become disheartened. Be like the early church in the book of Acts, those 120. Just keep seeking after. Just keep asking. Just keep pressing in. And at the right time, God will pour out his spirit on you. And you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit as well. It's an experience that you get to receive. Um, you know, because God, he poured out his Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit on those 120. He poured it out on a dozen in Ephesus. Uh, he poured it out on Cornelius' entire household. Um, you know, he, he poured it out on an unbelieving and hard-hearted, prideful Steve. Um, and countless millions of other people since the book of Acts chapter 2. And so, he'll baptize you as well in his Holy Spirit. Uh, but don't get tripped up on it. Just keep loving God. Keep serving him. Keep being hungry to grow and to receive every promise of God. God, and at the right time, you'll receive it. But I want to encourage you right now, you know, um, if you've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, that's a resource. Take full advantage of it. Uh, stay filled with the Spirit. Don't, be, don't settle for that one encounter you had with God. Ask God every day for a fresh outpouring, for a fresh anointing, for a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit, that you would be filled with the Spirit, uh, that you would live wisely, making the most of every opportunity, uh, that you wouldn't miss out on any of those things. And so uh, as we close here, um, you know, we're just going to pray and we're going to believe for that. And so Jesus... We believe your word to be true. You promised the gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And right now I just receive it. I ask you to pour out your spirit on me, fill me to overflowing, and teach me to, to walk in the spirit and to stay filled with it in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you so much. For those who are comfortable doing so, I can't wait to see you back uh, here at New Hope next week. Please make sure you jump online and watch a video walking you through what it's going to look like when you come to church. Uh, don't miss that uh, video. And uh, and if you, you don't have the opportunity to be online to see that, um, you know, make sure you reach out to me and I'll walk you through that. All right. God bless. We'll see you next week. And I'm just so excited to hear the testimonies of what God's doing in your life and how you have either been baptized in the Holy Spirit for the very first time or uh, how you've been filled afresh and anew, you know, through this teaching and through your willingness to seek after God for every promise he has for you. God bless.